Dear Father, we are so thankful that at this time of the day, we can come before you and uh, open your Holy Word again and look at the lesson for this coming week. We ask that your Holy Spirit may open our hearts and our minds and so that we can understand these wonderful truths. Bless us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, so far, what I've gotten out of uh, the study of Paul in, in the book of Acts is, uh, uh, is very enlightening to me because I notice that Paul is like a type of Christ. Have you noticed that? For what he went through and and, and even to the, to the word, the end of his life, it was so like Christ's life, you know, with all the uh, persecution and all the hardship and the trials that he went to, through. And do you know, he also just spent about three years, just as Jesus did, and, and then his life was cut short, right? So he's very much like Christ. He even said, I have fought a good fight. In, the, in his last words. And now, he said, I'm done. I finished the course. Isn't those the words that Jesus used? It is finished when he hung on the cross. So I see Paul very close to Christ. And there are other characters in the Bible, of course, as well, that we know, like Daniel, the type of Christ. Joseph was a type of Christ of the certain things in their lives that, that they did. Uh, but when we do the right things in the service of God, right? There is no guarantee that we will be kept safe, yes. right? Uh -huh. But we can know that God does not abandon us, right? Instead, he gives us what? He gives us the courage that we need to persevere. So the question that someone can ask is, why is it that when I'm on God's errands, in God's service, that there's no guarantee that he will protect me and save me and bless me? Why is that so? Have you ever thought of that? What, what is one good reason why there's no guarantee of Safety when you're on God's mission. Tribulation helps build your faith. Okay, that's, that's one good answer, sure. Yes. Anybody else? Why? Why is it? To be dependent upon Him. Yes. Because, you know, our life here is just temporary. Yes. He wants us, this is just, we are on heaven, but on, on earth. Yes. Our final home is heaven. Yes. So we're just doing God's will, God's work here. Yeah. That's our role here on earth. All right. Preparing for heaven. Okay. So he, he would assure us of eternal life. Yeah. yeah so, so that's another good answer. But anything else? Benji, what goes on in your mind? Why should there not be a guarantee when I'm on my father's business, on his errands? Why can I not depend on him to save me from harm, from danger? Well, there's a third answer. God, 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 God yes. will direct the person yes. to his will. Okay. But the person has also the power of choice. Yes. Will he do it or will he not? Okay. And every point along the way, he has that power yeah. of choice. Okay. All so right. God does not guarantee your safety if yeah. you defeat from his will. Okay. Because Satan is there ready to pounce on you. Yeah. Uh, but that, that should be all the more reason why God should say, My son, my daughter is on my errands. I'm not going to let anything happen to them. Yeah, but if, That's what we expect, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, if, but it doesn't happen, there's no guarantee. Yeah, because the person doing a God's errand can be tempted. Okay. And can change his mind. He has a free will, remember? Yeah, but for now, he's doing God's will. He may change that later on, but for now, why can my God not uh, protect me while I'm on his errand? Even if I may change my mind later on, I'm talking about now. Well, the, the, the third answer is simply this. 
If God had to protect all his children on his mission all of the time, then the, 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 the non-believer out there will join the forces because God is going to protect him. If that is what happens when you serve God, that you will never be hurt, never be harmed, never have trials, then hey, that's where I want to be. So the men and women out there will say, let's join that group. Because once you join, you're covered. You won't get sick. You won't get, nobody will hurt you. You'll have God's blessings. And God cannot have that. God says, no, you are just the same as anyone else. But I'll be with you. I won't abandon you. But I cannot give you that protection that uh, comes with serving me. Because like you, he said already, we need trials, right, Terry? We need trials. And, and we need to grow. We need to depend on him. But it's not like a blanket ticket. If you work for me, that I will save you always. Otherwise, the man in the street can say, I'm going to um, take the Bible. And even if I don't mean it, I'll just make, make like I'm on God's errands, then he'll protect me. God said, no, it doesn't work that way. You cannot just slip into, into my work and think that I will bless you. You know, I, I, will, I will protect you, I will be with you, but for you to grow, like was already said, for you to grow, you have to stay close to me. And I will take you through the trial. I won't take the trial away from you, because trial builds faith in me, but I will be with you always and give you the, 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 the courage to carry on. Right? So, okay, now, this week we are looking at chapters 21 through 23 as we, we talk about this fiasco and the arrest of Paul in Jerusalem. But let's begin by looking back just for a few minutes. The reason, or part of the reason why Paul was so determined to go back to Jerusalem Right? Why? He, was, he wanted to go there. He was determined that that's where I want to be at the end of his uh, third journey. I have to be there. Even though he knew of, of the risks that he was taking. Now there we see the type of Christ. Jesus wanted to go back to Jerusalem. He knew when his time was up, I've got to go there. And they said, but don't you know they are going to hurt you there. Well, I want to go there. And yet Paul is doing the same thing. He wants to go back to Jerusalem to see the rest. Well, you know, one of the reasons is, on one hand, why he wanted to go, he wanted to, to, to see his fellow Jews. He, I mean, he had a love for those people. He had a love for them. He wanted to see them. And on the other hand, he longed to have the church be united because he knew about that thing going on in the church, Jew and Gentile. And he wanted to go and see how he could bring the church together, how they could understand to accept that, 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 that righteousness and the grace of, of God through faith is, is the only thing equally Jew and Gentile could both enjoy that. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to have a united church. A united church. But sometimes, you know, we wonder, will God's church ever be united? <laughs> On this earth, will we always have unity in the church? No. No? Oh, that was uh, the prayer of Christ, that there may be one. Yeah, that was his prayer. Yes. Because they were not. Will they ever be? That's the question. No. Okay. And you don't think? Yeah. Yeah. And yes. What do you think, Rufo? Will the church ever be united before Christ returns? There's always the tears and the we together. Yeah. Because uh, he doesn't want to pull out those tears yeah. because that would help the we also yes. grow stronger and better. Yeah. So there's always conflict. Yes. They cannot be fully. United until it comes Absolutely back. true. Because the church is not the building. We know. The, the church are people. We are the church. And the problem with unity is that we are part of it. it it's me. It, it's, I am part of it. And, and if I can just 
Unity begins with me. Unity be if we can take I out of the way, if we can get out of the way, the church would become united. If we could be humble, in fact. And as I looked at that, I looked at something and I found something very interesting. I found something very interesting. The people back there, and even today, have eye, an eye problem. They've got an eye problem. And it's not the, the, this eye problem. It's this eye problem. They had an eye problem. And so, and so if we can overcome I, if we can overcome I, surrender I, then things will come together. Because we are making this the center and of, of everything. And we forget in the beginning, this was the problem. I remember Lucy, and I found something interesting. Lucifer. Right in the middle of his name, he had the eye problem right there. I is right in the center of his name in the beginning. And, and he, he became proud. He wanted to establish his kingdom above the heavens. And you know, the word pride have the same letter in the middle of the word. Right in the center. Pride. And so, if you make yourself the center, instead of having Christ the center, that's where the problem lies. And then, that's how we have this thing called... What's in the center of sin? I. That's what they found out. That's why we sin, because we want to please self. That we can't get unity, because you know why? Unity involves I. Look at this. What's in the center of unity? It's I. And I was thinking, wow. We cannot get unity. We got to get this guy out in the middle. He's the problem to get unity. And when you, when you have pride in your heart, you think that you are the center, then things begin to unravel. Because if you take this word unity or unite, let's use the word unite. If we want to unite something, this guy, the problem here, he wants to be everywhere. He thinks he can be usurp any position because he wants to please himself. So if he wants to move around in this word unite, you know what he does? He can do this. He can say, I don't like my position here. I want to do my position anywhere I like. So what he does, he can do it like this. He can do, he can put himself there. And look what he does now. Instead of unity, he unties the unity. He can untie it. No, I don't want to be united. I don't want to. Then, then, I, won't get the, then I won't get all the praise. But I just go wherever I like. So look where he is now. And when, I just found it interesting that if you just move the eye around, instead of unity, you've got untie. You untie the whole thing. And the best part of it all is, if we want unity, we have to leave Christ in the center. Amen. If we turn the eye and accept Christ and be humble as he, that's how we get unity right there. When you make Christ the center and not yourself. The cross when we come to the cross, then we will get unity in the church. But because we don't have Christ in our hearts, we don't come to the cross, we don't, are not fully committed to him, we don't make him the center, we will never have unity. Right. Absolutely. I have yeah. Yes. Uh, 
I don't know what you consider this at the time of the end. Yes. The cross of probation. Yes. Then godly would be godly. Yes. And the godly could be godly. Yes. And then the duplication of Christ's character will be seen. To the that's true. I think that's where the point of unity will come. Yes. At the end of probation. Yes. Because this, this uh, those we, they know, we know that those who are not godly, they will remain. Yes. But those who are godly, to be godly, you have know what? Unity in the church. Yes, yes. Okay, we are still not perfect church. Yeah. But time comes because the, the end of probation, there's no way to go. Either way, one or the other. Or the other way. That's so true. when you go the other way, the way of God, yes. you'll be united. If you accept Christ, right. if you, when, when, when I accept the cross, when I accept the cross as an individual member of God's church, I will contribute to unity. That's the beauty. Of, and I looked at that and I said, how true it is. The church will never have unity until it begins with me, until it begins with you. When you accept, you come to the foot of the cross, say, Lord, I'm nothing. I'm your servant. Please forgive my sins. And you come to the foot of the cross and he cleanses that. Then, like Rufo was saying, people will come in. They will come because they'll see the beauty of Christ in you. And that is what Paul was saying all his life. For me to live is Christ. Right? That's why the church is a lot of time is in this stage it has been because because of the people in the church. Exactly. 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 Yeah. We, we always call for revival. Yes. We get our own eye, my eye out of the way, your eye. You know, people don't yes. look at the church and just shake their heads. And, Absolutely. You know. I agree with you on this. These people are hypocrites. Yeah, yeah. And that's what the pastor was preaching this morning. Do you remember what he said? That Ellen White's uh, message was yes. We need the dry bones are out there, outside of the church, but how many dry bones are in the church? See? So when, when there's a call to come out of Babylon, we're always thinking of the non-believer Babylon, but there's a lot of people that need to come out of Babylon in Babylon. You step on a lot of toes when saying I know, but, but hey, there's no, no more time to, to relax and to give nice words and speeches. Because it's the end of time. We've got to wake people up and say, hey, this boat is going to sink, people. You want to sink with it or you want to jump off? What do you, you want to be saved or you want to go down with the boat? There's a boat next to you that's strong and sturdy. Step on up. They say, no, we like this one. This one has got more games. This one has got more pleasure on here. We, you guys are all military over there. We want to be here. See? That's the man's thoughts. And so the warning comes to all of us. Well, let's get back to the, to the lesson for next week coming. Uh, Paul's uh, arrest in, in Jerusalem. But So he, ca- he comes back to Jerusalem and he was meeting with the elders. So let's go to Acts chapter 21. That's where we start. And we, we read verse 15 through 17. 15, 16, and 17. So let's find out what happened as Paul makes his journey back into Jerusalem. So what happens when he gets there? 15, uh, 15 16, 17. What happened when he arrived? After those days, we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Also some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and we brought with them a certain medicine of Cyprus. A uh, yeah. yeah. disciple with whom we were to us. Okay. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. They did. Uh, okay, yeah, that, and that's it. Yeah. So, so what happens here now, as Rufo was reading there, when, he, when they, he came to Jerusalem, verse 17 says, and when we had come, Paul is saying, to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Ah, they were happy to see him come back because he was been on this uh, the, the missionary journey, this third missionary journey. Now he's coming back. He's going to give a report and find out if he's accepted there and what they think of his trip. And they greeted him gladly, warmly received. And there was a, a gentleman by the name of Manasseh with whom he was staying there. And uh, so what happened next? Let's read verses 18 through 22. 
Okay? So, so there he is now, and the men are, the brethren are there, and James is in charge of the church there, and the other elders. So it says in verse 18 that uh, on the following day, Paul went in with us to, uh, this is Luke talking about now, Luke uh, writing, to James and all the elders who were present. And when he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they all are zealous for the law? But they have been informed about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor walk according to the customs. So there's a problem. He says, you know, you did good over there, but a lot of the Jews, they believe that you haven't been teaching the right thing over there. And so, uh, verse 22 says, what then? What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. So, what's happening? There's, there's a problem. And James and the elders are, are giving him a heads up. Hey, there's trouble here because people are saying that you have been uh, 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 teaching the, the, the people the wrong, the wrong message over there. That's what he said, right? They've been told that he had been teaching the Jewish converts who lived abroad about uh, Moses. He said, don't, don't worry about Moses so much. And, you know... Uh, circumcising your children is not necessary anymore. Don't do that. In fact, the customs, a lot of the customs that you guys have been doing, don't worry about that. And he brought those people. That's what they said. That's what they said. So, what counsel did the church leaders give Paul to calm the fears of the people? They, they gave him some counsel. And that counsel is found in uh, verse 18 through 25 of uh, Acts 21. We keep reading and we'll find out what is the counsel that they gave to Paul. What did they say? We read verse, uh, verse uh, uh, we start, well, we read from verse 18 and so we're going to read on, I think I stopped at verse 22. So let's read 23 to 25. What, did, what counsel did they give? Yes. Mistake and purify thyself through them. Yes. And be a charges for them that they may shave their heads, and all shall know that there is no truth in the things whereof they have been informed concerning thee. But that thou thyself also walkest orderly keeping the law. Yeah. Verse 25. Verse 25. But as touching the Gentiles that have believed, we wrote, giving judgment that they should keep themselves from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled, and from fornication. So what they were saying, the advice they're giving Paul now, they're saying to Paul, you know, uh, you, you, should be, uh, you should be politically correct. Tell these people that, that, that you have not done those things. But in order to show it to them, maybe you should, uh, maybe you should do something very Jewish. Do something Jewish. And so they proposed, they said, well, this is what you do, to sponsor the Nazarite vow. The Nazarite vow was the thing where the, um, an act, like an act of piety, if you've been out of the country, especially he as a leader, if you've been mixing with the Gentiles and you've been away, then when you come back to Jerusalem, then you have to uh, get good again. Like, like you had to go for a week, you have to, your, your head has to be shaven. Uh, you have to take this vow. And then you have to show yourself to the priest to be accepted again. So they said to Paul, well, why don't you do that? There's four guys already that are ready to, to, to come back in. Can you go with them and go through this rite? And then to show yourself to the priest. And then the people will know that, that, you, that you didn't do these other things, that you are very Jewish still. 
So what does verse 26 say happened next? What did he do in verse 26? Then both the man and the next day had been, having been purified and then entered the temple to announce expiration of the days of purification and which time an offering should be made to its one day. So look what he did. Unfortunately, he yielded to this this uh, 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 request. He healed it to re The question is, why did he comply with this request? Can you think of, a, of an answer, Terry? Why do you think Paul complied with the request they made to him to become pious, to go and purify yourself, and take these four men, and then come back and show yourself to the priest? Why do you think he complied with the request? What do you think? To avoid probably to avoid trouble? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, okay, yeah. And that was isn't that what, what Paul was doing all the time? He always said that, right? Maybe he was just following the, his own principle of behaving like a Jew when dealing with the Jews. But the, the next question is, was this compliance appropriate? Was it appropriate for him to do what he did? A man of God, uh, a, 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 like say, we can say a pastor, an apostle who preached, was, was that the right thing to have done? That is the question. Was it? Maybe not the right thing, but if, if it's not all things are right, but now, I mean, I don't know how to say this. Yeah, now I know what you're talking about. Um, um, yeah. It might not have been really right, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it wasn't wrong, you know what I mean? It wasn't, okay. it wasn't hurting nobody or anything, okay. you know what I mean? I'm not sure how to say that. No, 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 I know exactly what you mean. But you know what Ellen White says on that little, little uh, uh, false step that he took in doing that? In uh, Acts of the Apostles, I don't know if I have it in your, in your uh, uh, outline there. Acts of the Apostles, page 405, you know what she says about what he did? He was not authorized of God to concede as much as they asked. She said, he, in other words, he should not have done that. He was not at their mercy. You know, he was working for God. Now, he's not the only one. He was just human. Right, Terry? He was just human, and so he did. Uh, we know of a few other people in the Bible, too, that conceded to people. Abram did it one time. Moses was, also did that at another time. But here, Paul actually gave in. He was willing to compromise. That's what was going on. He was willing to compromise. You know what the Oxford Dictionary said? What, what do you think compromise means? What, what is the meaning of compromise? When you compromise something. Okay. <laughs> okay. You, you kind of want to meet people in the middle, right? Actually, Oxford Dictionary says about compromising, it says it's like a mutual concession. You, you, you come to a mutual agreement, right? So you may be right, I may be wrong, but, but okay, we'll, I'll meet you halfway, right? And the other thing that, that, that Oxford says is that uh, it means that, that uh, to modify, when it, you compromise, is to modify one's principles. That's what it means. Like finding a happy balance. You know, you tip the scales. So, so you're not eating the truth. You're giving in to meet somebody on, on, on a mutual, yeah. to, to reach a mutual level. Or differences by arbitration, yes, or by consent reached by mutual concession. Right. So, so then you just need to be happy in in where you meet each other. Yeah. 
I may be 100% right. You may be wrong, but in order to please you, we compromise. So Paul was willing to compromise. That's exactly what it is. To meet them, those people's needs. Well, the thing is now, so, so that, that question arises and says, is that right to do, to compromise the truth? If you know the truth and have the truth, you cannot compromise truth. No. You, you no matter what. So that's what Ellen White is trying to tell us here. You know, that is what she's saying. So the question is, in our attempts, talking about us now, bring it home, in our attempts to be relevant, how can we be careful not to make a similar kind of error that Paul did? What, what can we do to avoid that compromise? Because sometimes we, we do. In the church we compromise. Sometimes when you talk to your friends and you say, well, they don't really know, so let's give in a little. Don't be so hard on them. Uh, you know the truth, but you're willing to compromise. Even if you want to stay relevant, you know, and you step over the line. Right, Terry? Sure, we probably do it all the time, too. So the thing is, uh, so the thing is, is it right to do? And Ellen White says that, you know, God does not give us license to do that. So how can we be careful not to make the same mistake again as, as Paul did? We should say to ourselves, never, never compromise the truth or principle. Do not bend to popular opinion. Sometimes you see the whole crowd is going that way. And you say, well, I may as well. No, don't do that. Stand for the right. Stand for principle. It doesn't matter if you're alone. And that's hard to do. Right? subjects in this church that we don't discuss. Yes. Um, and I'm not going to say what they are because yes, yes. there are people that would be stepping on their toes and yes. I step on my own toes. Yes. It, it, it just, we compromise. That's things. right. And that's not right because, because truth is, is ultimate. God is truth. Jesus <laughs> is truth. And when we compromise, we, we dilute the truth. Sometimes we know something is right and we just say, well, he, he, she didn't mean it that, that way. Or when we're dealing with our youth, sometimes when they need to be disciplined, then we, uh, then we cut, then we dilute, right? We say, well, don't be so hard on them. Uh, you know, he didn't know. She. Well, the thing is, these young people are looking up to you to see where you stand on principle. And you're dropping the ball and you're telling, no, you can come in anyways. <laughs> You know, what are you telling your kids? What are you telling them when you do that? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. In my head sometimes. Yes. I know what you say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we need to be so careful that when we do that, when we compromise, that we will, we will go against truth and we will uh, divert ourselves from principle and, and God does not <laughs> smile gently on that. You may not be popular, you may, may be unpopular, but you have to stand for what is right, you know. And, and Paul dropped the ball there a little, but that's for our learning. We should know. He should have said no to those people. He said, no, I, I'm not doing that. I'm not purifying myself. I did nothing wrong, you know. I, what the, the rumors they are spreading is, is, what, is, is what they here say and stand for what was right. Okay, so let's move on. So there was a riot that broke up in the temple. So let's go to Acts chapter uh, 21. That's where we are still now. And we're going to read uh, verses 27 through 30. What was happening? 27 through 30. Okay. During the seven days were almost completed when Jews from Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stared up all the multitude and laid hands on him, crying yes. out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and, and, and this place. And moreover, he brought Greeks also into the temple and had, had defiled this holy place. For they had seen him 
they had before sinned with him in the city of Trophimus, the Ephesian, yes. whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. Yes. And the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they laid hold on Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and straightway the doors were shut. My goodness. Right in the church. Right in the church. There was these Jews. You know, and the more you read about it all through Paul's life, who seemed to be giving him the most trouble? The Jews. They're his own people. And I'm thinking about our church. You know, and it's true that when the time of trouble comes and we, the church begins to be persecuted, it will not be so much from the people outside. It will be from your own people. And that hurts when your own people turn against you. That's not nice. You know, your neighbors can do things to you. Your friends can do things to you. But when your own family, Terry, when your own family steals from you or, or don't want to uh, pay back a debt that you've given to them, and they, that hurts you a lot. You can rather have some strange person, but when your own that's very close to you turn against you or make rumors about you or say nasty things, that really hurts. Gossip. Yes. Adding hurts more. Yes. It's just as supposed to be a family. Yes, right. So, so that is why I'm looking at Paul's life and a lot of these trials and persecution are in the church. So they grabbed him, they seized him. And the problem was simply, they said, he brought this gentleman with him there that, that, uh, from, from uh, um, uh, where, where was he from? Uh, he brought him from... Uh, Ephesians, like Ephesus, right? Mm -hmm. and, and he brought him with, and they said, well, he was a non-Jew, and they brought, he brought them in, and he stepped over the line. You know, when they worshipped back there in the temple, there was the place for the men Jews to be, a place for the ladies, and then for all other visitors, they had to go beyond the wall. They couldn't come anywhere close to those, those areas. But here he brought, they say, he brought a stranger that was uncircumcised, they brought him in there, and... Uh, and uh, he brought him just beyond the wall. He crossed the line, you know. Uh, in, in, when you read uh, Ellen White in Acts of the Apostles, again on page 407, you'll see how she explains that. By the Jewish law, it was a crime, she says, punishable with death for an uncircumcised person to enter the inner courts of the sacred edifice. Paul had been seen in the city in company with uh, Trophimus, an Egyptian, an Ephesian, and it was conjectured that he had brought him into the temple, and even though this was not true, that he had not done. So that's what was going on. So what happened next? They, they, they threw them out of the, of the church, and they closed the doors. And the Bible made sure they, they put that in. Luke said, they shut the doors behind them. You're not coming in here. And you could read between the lines. So let me read verse 31 through 36. So, what happened next? Verse 31. Yes, somebody has that. And as they were sitting to kill him, yes. the tidings came up to the chief captain of the band. Yes. And all Jerusalem was in confusion. Yes. And forthwith he took soldiers and centurions and ran down upon them. And they, and they when they saw the chief captain, and the soldiers left off beating Paul. Yes. Then the chief captain came near and laid hold on him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and inquired who he was and what he had done. Yes. And some shouted one thing, some another among the crowd. And when he could not know the certainty for the uproar, he commanded him to be brought into the castle. Yes. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the crowd. For the multitude of the people followed after crying out, away with him. Oh man, where did you hear those words? <laughs> oh my goodness, where did you hear those words and the scene kind of similar? That's why I said Paul is so like a type of Christ, Brother Rufo. Mm -hmm. they, look, look at the same thing, away with him, crucify him. And, and, and Pilate said, no, this man had done nothing wrong. They said, we don't care. We want the, he said, here is, a, here is Barabbas. This is your real murderer right here. I'll give you him. They said, no, we don't. Well, let him go free. You crucify him. Oh, my goodness. And I read Paul's account of the people who were bloodthirsty after him. They used the same words. 
Away with him. In other words, let's kill him. Let's get, let, let's get done with him. Oh my goodness. And the, 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 the soldiers had to, this guy had to help him. Otherwise they would tear him to pieces. So they brought him in into that, uh, that fortress there. My goodness. So, uh, he reached, the riot reached the Roman fortress and this guy, Claudius, the commander, Roman commander Lysias, he came with troops and he rescued Paul before the crowd could really tear him to pieces. So the question is, what lesson can we learn about the danger of, 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 of spreading false rumors? <laughs> what, what lesson can we learn from that? You know, this was all false accusations they brought and spread about, about Paul. The same as they did with Christ. They said he was coming to overthrow the government. They call him king. It's their king. That's why Pilate was asked, are you a king? And Jesus said, you said it. So they, they said he's coming to overthrow the government. And so they, the same with Paul. The rumors were, were, were terrible. Well, if you, if you don't check yourself in spreading rumors, what can be the result of it? What can be the result of spreading false rumors? Well, for one, pe people can get hurt, right? Yeah, you can get killed. You can get killed. People get hurt. They get, uh, you know, you spoil them mentally. You spread something that's not true. These people are trying to clear their name. You, you, you spoil them spiritually. You know, they get hurt uh, spiritually. Socially, if you smear their name in their community. Church. Yeah. And, and you just, it's not nice because people now have to clear their name of all the stuff that you said that was not true about them. And frankly, it stifles the work of the church. You know, if, the, if there's something that happens in the church with a false rumor, now you've got to spend time in, in getting the peace back to church, and it's just a matter of wasting time. You know, the, and that's what the enemy likes. The devil likes when you're not moving forward. He loves that. Bring, some, bring something in the church, some bad thing, so that I, they can stall. They don't have to leave, move forward. And more people leave the church for the internal things like that. And yeah. Who could the doctrine? Yes. Or some, uh, you know, something like that. Exactly. Oh, yeah. That's very true. All right, so, so let's move on. Now, so Paul is now with this uh, guy, this Roman uh, commander, and, 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 and Paul is getting ready to do something uh, different. So let's see what, what verse 37 through 40 has to say in, in chapter 21, Acts 21, 37 to 40. What does it say there? As Paul was about to be brought into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, Why did say something unto thee? And he said, Dost thou know Greek? Art thou not then the Egyptian who before this day stared up to sedition and mm -hmm. went out? into the wilderness, the 4,000 men of the assassins. Mm -hmm. But Paul said, I am a Jew of Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. Mm. And I beseech thee, give me, give me leave to speak unto the people. And when he had given him leave, Paul standing on the stairs, beckoned with a hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew language, saying, Okay. Okay, so you read up to verse 40. 40. That's good. That's good. Uh, saying, and then uh, we will read what, 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 he said, what he said later. But, but here he was. So, how did Paul convince this commander, this Roman governor, to grant him some permission to speak to the crowd? He said, I'm, I need to get to the crowd. I need to, I need to talk to them. I need to tell them. So, so, so how, did he, how did he convince this commander to give him the opportunity to do that? Yes. He said, I'm a Jew from Tarsus, right? And I'm a Roman. That's what he said. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Jew from Tarsus and, and I'm a, in Cilicia. And it's a, a, a citizen of no mean city. He means that this city is very notable. Tarsus is not a cheap place, a, a small village. 
He said, you know, and I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he, when he had given him permission, so this guy gave him permission, you know, he said to him, okay, then I'll grant you to speak. So, so why did he, why did, and, then, and then he spoke. Then he spoke this whole, all the way, he started out in chapter 22, verse 1, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. Look how he addresses them, brethren. <laughs> you, in other words, you my people. And fathers, you, I respect you. You are above me. I mean, he came, he implored them, he brought a nice speech to them. And when they heard that he spoke to them in Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. In other words, hey, this guy, this guy, he was speaking in Greek to these, to these guys. Now he's speaking in Hebrew to us. Yeah, now they, he got their attention. The Hebrew, they kept all the more silent. And then he said, I am indeed a Jew. And he gave him that whole history of himself, right? Born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you all are today. What was he saying there? What did he mean by that? Zealous as you all are today. Yeah, but what he was doing actually, yeah, Brother Rufo, he was reminding them, I was like you once before, and I went, I was zealous. I went to go and grab the Christians. Remember, remember, remember. And they knew very well. He said, I was like you once before. Zealous to, 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 to go after people and, and for the wrong reason. So he gave them that whole, and he told them down in verse 7, when he met up with, with, with this uh, power on the road to Damascus, I fell to the ground. I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And gave them that whole thing there. And verse 10, so I said, what shall I do? And, and, uh, and then the, the voice came, the Lord said, arise and go to Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. So he told them this whole experience. He gave that whole testimony. So why do you think Paul, why do you think Paul uh, uh, shared his conversion story with them instead of preaching to them? Why do you think he shared his conversion story instead? Yes. True to life experience, right? That, that's why he did it. What were you saying, Terry? And uh, as a Jew, I think he told the whole story too like this. Is, he's saying that, hey, I'm a Jew, but it doesn't matter. God, you know, I can be saved without the law, without keeping all this Jewish stuff that, you know, these people yeah. all do. I was zealous for this and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Like you people were like until I met. Yes. Yeah. Until I met Christ on that road. Yeah. I was freed from the law. Yes. And, and, and what I learned from this is, I get from this is, you know, a per, there's nothing like a personal testimony. When you, tell, when you talk to, when you bring somebody to Christ, and it's good to tell them how so-and-so came, how so-and-so came into the truth. But then when you say how I came, you gave, give them your own personal, then they more, they listen. It's not a, like a third party talking about somebody. No, it's you. You telling me exactly what God did for you. That's a very powerful. And he did exactly that. He recounted his own. He, re, he recounted his own experience boldly, telling why he was doing what he did, to show and uh, that he was genuine. He wasn't making it up. And then he spoke in their language. On top of that, he, you know, he, bro he broke it down in their own language and told them that it was God and the Holy Spirit that sent him to the Gentiles. And it seemed to impress them when they were talking in their own, in their own language, too. Yeah. You know, they listened more. Exactly, yeah. Like, in like, other words, wow. he got, got on their own level, yeah. he got on their own and the language, 
like you say. So he got the attention, you know. So, so what I take from that is also speaking in the same language. I pick up from that is when we talk to people, speak their language. Do you know what I mean by that? Don't go there as a pastor. You know what I mean? If you're talking to your friend about the scriptures, don't think that you are an evangelist now. You want to give him 40 texts before you leave him. No, you're going to lose him. Right? Yes, you will. You use the language. Use his language. Right? And be one-on-one. -on -one. That's how you win people. Don't make yourself like higher than they, than they are. You know? And just come down on their level. You know? Say, like, I'm, I'm like you. I'm... I'm and I'm just like, I'm no better than you, but this is what I found, how God came into my life, and that same God can come in your life. And don't give him like a high things to do, hoops to jump over. No, that, it's easy to serve God. It's easy to serve God. Give him your life, give him your heart, and you will see he'll make your, your path straight. You know? And that's how we reach people, by getting on, on, on their level. So... Now, uh, let's go to, uh, to what happened next. Something interesting happens next. So let's read verse, uh, chapter 22. We'll be in chapter 22, now we go to verse 25 through 29. So what happened next? 25 through 29. When they had tied him up with the thorns, yes. Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and can uncondemned? And when the centurion heard it, he went to the chief captain and told him, saying, What art thou about to do? For this man is a Roman. Yes. And the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? And he said, Yeah. And the chief captain answered with a great sum of pain, I the citizenship. And Paul said, But I am a Roman born. They then that were about to examine him straightway departed from him. And the chief captain also was afraid when he knew that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. But on the morrow, desiring to know that certainly wherefore he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him and commanded the chief priest and all the council to come together and brought Paul down and set him before them. Right. So, so here he was now. Paul was bound and he was taken captive, taken prisoner, and, and they were about to beat him and do the nasty things. In fact, they, they wanted to scourge him. And when I hear that word scourge, you know, and the beatings, I think of Christ again. Paul and Christ's lives are so parallel. They run so parallel. And they had beaten him before, right? They had beaten Paul before. They had stoned him <coughs> before. I mean, the, the amount of things that Paul went through, stoning, beating, he had to run for his life. Uh, he was shipwrecked. He was bitten by a snake. He was... <laughs> And he went through some things, and his own people went to grab him and kill him, uh, you know, away with him. There was Paul. And so now comes to the last part here. And, 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 and uh, Paul now, uh, Paul was able to avoid the scourging, though, and this beating. So how, how was Paul able to avoid being scourged? What, what did he do? Yes. 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 Person, that person said that it was hard for him to get that citizenship, but with Paul, he was born Roman. Exactly right. Yeah. And Paul was, and he was right. He, he was a born Roman, grew up in, in Jerusalem, but he was born as a Roman citizen. And so he said, I, I'm a Roman citizen, you guys. And they took that message to the captain, to the, to, to the commander, and said to him, hey, this guy is, a, is you know, he's Roman. What? What? Yeah, he's Roman. Look what you're doing to him. And Paul said, that, I appeal. I want to go to Rome. I appeal. I'm a Roman citizen. And then they backed off. They said, well, we, we, we got we to gotta watch what we do because we cannot do that to our own if it's a Roman citizen. So you get special privileges when you get a Roman citizen. Absolutely. Just like us here in the States, if you're an American citizen, you get stranded on an island or wherever you are in the world and you need help. I mean, we do, we do every, you go to the embassy there and they do anything in their power to get you what you need because you are an American. You know, they can't treat you just like a, a foreigner in another place and, 
You know, so you can appeal to your country, and, and the country will do lots of things to get you freed or to get you papers or to get you a ticket to come home or something like that. Same, it started way back then already. If you're a citizen of a country or, or a city, uh, then you get privileges. And so that's what happened here with Paul. So Paul let the commander know, or, or the, the people there, that the guy that came up to him to let him know. So now, when the commander realized that Paul did not represent a threat to the empire, he asked the Sanhedrin to take over the case. He, he said, okay, so, you know, he's a Roman, he's not going to over, overthrow the city. He's a, himself a Roman, and uh, Paul was... He heard what the, Paul was speaking to those people in Hebrew. He told them the whole story. He said, this guy is not a threat to us, you know. He's not a threat. So I don't want to deal with this case anymore. So he appealed to the Sanhedrin and said, you guys take the case. Take him. I'm done with him now. So that brings us to, 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 to chapter 23. So what happens next? Verses 1 through 5. What happens next? We're coming to towards the end. So, uh, uh, so let, let's read that 1 through 5. 23, 1 through 5. Then Paul looking the heresy of the Gallows, said many brethren, I am leaving all good counsels for God until this day. Yeah. And that was an unnatural man of those who stood by him to strike him on the mark. Then Paul said to him, God would strike you, you white, was more poor. You see the judge me according to the law and you command me. To be struck under the door. And those who stood by said, Do you revile God's high priest? Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, but he, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. Huh. Well, that's verse 5, right? So now, how, <laughs> did, did, you, did you notice how, how Paul uh, defended uh, uh, his defense before the Sanhedrin? Yeah, the, well, he started and verse 1 got him into trouble. Right? He said, when he said in verse 1, uh, then, then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, men and brethren. He started out already. That he, Look, I'm one of you guys, men and brethren. I have lived in all good conscience before. What? God. Right? And until this day. And that got him a slap in the mouth. Paul's introductory statement met with a slap on the mouth because he was, re he was reference uh, to God was blasphemous in their sight. You, you, you evoke the name of God in, in your life's doings. So they slapped him. They slapped him in the face. Also, we know that the Sanhedrin was composed of both uh, Sadducees and Pharisees, right? Yes. So we know the difference between those two guys, <coughs> right? The Pharisees had a different, they, they, they differed on, on issues in the church. For example, the uh, Sadducees, they did not believe in the resurrection, right, of the body, of the dead. And so, and so Paul did something here. So he was stirring up something. Paul knew about these two groups in the Sanhedrin. So how did Paul very, very ingeniously try to disrupt the proceedings in verse 6? What, what does verse 6 say? Paul was trying, but I was being very smart. What did he do? He knew the two groups were there. Verse 6, yes. That the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees. He cried out in the council, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees, touching the hope and resurrection of the dead I am called in question. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Yes. And the assembly was divided. Okay. And the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Okay, right up to that point. Yes. yes. So there it is. So it's a, Paul said in a loud voice, so he was not silent, he was not quiet. He said, hey, brethren, brethren, he raised his voice high. He said, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. He made sure they know what he's talking about. He let them know, hey, I'm a Pharisee. 
And, and I'm a son of a Pharisee. In other words, my father was a Pharisee as well. And concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. He said, why I'm here with you guys is because I'm talking about a resurrected Christ. That's what he was really saying. That's why I'm here. You see, the resurrection was the, the real issue why he was being judged since it was a resurrected Christ. A resurrected Christ whom he met on the road and who was instructing him in all this. So he let them know loud and clear. He wasn't silent. He wasn't quiet. It says he said in a loud voice so everybody could hear what he was saying. Well, they come to the last part in uh, verse 12 through 15. Yep, they were not done with him yet. They still wanted to, to, to get rid of him. So what happened next? In verse 12 to 15 of chapter 23. And when it was day, the Jews banded together and yeah. bound themselves unto a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And they were more than 40 then that made this conspiracy. Yes. And they came to the chief priest and the elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse to taste nothing until we have killed Paul. Now therefore do ye with a counsel signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you as though, as though ye would judge of his case more exactly and we before he comes near are ready to slay him. <laughs> But we are ready to kill him before he comes near. That's the New King James Version. These people were hungry. They were bloodthirsty. They wanted him. They wanted to kill him. They wanted, let's face it. They wanted to get rid of him uh, there. And so um, how did God intervene in this dangerous situation? In verse 11, we already saw that in verse 11 when you read verse 11. How did God intervene there in that situation? But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said to him, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. A message from God. A message from God. That's how God intervened. God assured him, I'm with you. I'm with you. You know? And that night, as Paul was in the fortress, that's when God approached him and gave him that beautiful message. And that message included Rome. Do you notice? Mm -hmm. And Paul always wanted to go to Rome, right? Mm -hmm. He said he wanted to go to Rome. I wanted to go to Rome. He was, he was going to go there and, uh, and, and do another journey towards there. But uh, he wasn't going to get there without chains, right? Mm -hmm. He wasn't going to. But, but it was in the promise of the Lord. So you must also bear witness at Rome. That's what it, what it says. So that's how God intervened in this dangerous situation. Number one. Number two. Uh, well, let's, let, there's, a quote, there's a quote also in, um, in uh, Acts of the Apostles, page 413, uh, where Ellen White says, Paul had long looked forward to visiting Rome, he greatly desired to witness for Christ there, but had felt that his purposes were frustrated by the enemy, by the, uh, uh, the enmity of the Jews. He little thought, even now, that it would be as a prisoner that he would go there. He didn't know why, but, but God said, you will, you, you will go to Rome. You will go to Rome. So, in, in verses 16 through 22, then this is the second way that God intervened, right? First one, gave him this beautiful promise, I'm with you. And then the second way that God saved him from this dangerous situation was verse 16 through 22. 16 verse 22. What does it say there? 16 verse 22. Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, yes. and he came and entered into the castle and told Paul. And Paul called unto him one of the centurions and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he had something to tell him. 
So he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul the prisoner called me unto him and asked me to bring this young man unto thee who had something to say to thee. Yes. And the chief captain took, took him by the hand and going aside asked him privately, What is it that thou hast to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to ask thee to bring down Paul tomorrow unto the council as though thou wouldest, wouldest inquire somewhat more exactly concerning him. Do not thou therefore yield unto them, for there lie in wait for him of mm. them more than forty men who have bound themselves under a curse, neither to eat nor to drink till they have slain him. And now are they ready, looking for the promise from thee. So the chief captain let the young man go, charging him, Tell no man that thou hast signified these things to me. And he called okay. unto him two of the centurions okay. and said, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go as far as Caesarea, and horsemen three score and ten, and spearmen two hundred at the third hour of the night. Okay. So look at that. Look at that. Uh, I didn't even know he had a sister. Paul had a sister. I guess he had brothers and sisters. But this was his nephew. His sister's son was... And he heard what this mob was trying to do the next day. The mob said, okay, if he brings him out, you know, to, for more questioning, then we'll just pounce on him and then we, he'll be overrun. We'll be ready. And this young boy heard it. And he came to tell Paul. I mean, that's how the, the God worked. And he, the young boy, Paul said, you go tell the commander what you heard. And he went there and told the commander. So this young nephew did his job. God, God uh, had him ready there, you know, and, uh, and look what it avoided. So they thought they were going to get, that'll be done with Paul the next day. But this commander was ready. Look what, he was prepared, man. He, he prepared 200 soldiers. <laughs> oh, and, and infantry horsemen and, and 200 spearmen. Uh, you know, to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night and provide mounts to set Paul on, things for Paul to ride on, bring him safely to Felix the governor, you know. So he was ready. God always, God has a plan. And we started out saying there is no guarantee. Remember what we said in the beginning? There is no guarantee. But God intervenes many times in the lives of his people. It's just not a guarantee that he will. But when he sees fit for you to go through what you're going through, then that's the way he'd like you to end up, you know. But many times he will send his angels. Many times he'll send uh, uh, like people to uh, protect you or so in his, in his time. And, and it depends on God. We cannot dictate. We can ask him for protection. We can show him our, that we need him, and he'll give, he'll give that in maybe in a settling of our mind, keeping us at peace, or he'll say, go through the fire, you know, you need to be refined, you know, whatever he does, we do, or says we do. And that's how the Christian's life has always been. Yeah, Paul was spared. How many times was Paul spared? He was, he was stoned. He was supposed to be dead. But then he gets up, he shakes all the heavy bricks and stuff that they threw him on the head, and then he walks away. <laughs> yeah, they thought he was dead. Because nobody survives a stoning. Nobody survives stoning. So there was a heap of stones in it. I mean, if somebody just throws a small brick on, on your side of your head, how long can you survive? And there was hundreds of stones that were coming. The guy just shook it off, got up bleeding, walked away. You know? So God is there. He's still our, uh, our God. God used Paul's nephew to alert the Roman commander. He had this beautiful message from God to say, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm still there. I'm here. I'm, I'm seeing everything. I'm seeing everything, you know. So the last question, main question is of the lesson, the last one is, what encouragement can you find in this story when you face danger as a servant of Jesus. What, what, what courage can you take from, from the story of Paul? When you face dangers, you go on God's errands, on his mission, and, uh, or, or just trying to live a life for Christ. What can, we, what can you take away from the story? Yes. Regardless of what situation you're in, yes. you might not be, you might face danger, if it's your time to rest, he will let you, he will allow, 
that to happen. Yes. But if your mission for him is not yet finished, it would really uh, save you. Yes. And yes. And he has done that with many people, right? Mm -hmm. Many, many, not only in the Bible. We read many stories like that in our mission, our mission books. We see how the missionaries were saved and, and they were just, I mean, God was just present. You can't explain it, but, uh, but a God had put, had put some hedge around this person and God protects his people. But if he does not choose to do that, don't be angry. Don't be mad at him and say, why did you allow me to go through it? Because that's our portion. God is working on our lives and polishing us. Any other comment? If not, then we can say the closing prayer. Okay, let's bow our heads. Dear Father, we are so thankful for the Bible that gives us all these wonderful lessons through your people that went before us. We are so thankful that we are studying the book of Acts and uh, the character of, of uh, Paul. How you have brought him from where he was, Saul, and then brought him to where he is now, Paul and your servant, a faithful servant. And we can learn so many lessons from his life. Lord, he never asked for safety. He never asked you to put a hedge around him. He said, if I must perish, I will perish. But he went forward and spread your gospel to everyone. And so, Lord, may that be encouragement to us that as we go about doing your work, that we will do it faithfully, whether we have setbacks and whether we go through uh, the fiery furnace, we know that you are there with us to guide us, to give us uh, courage, and to help us to persevere. So one day when you return, we'll be ready to be uh, a part of your kingdom in the new Jerusalem. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.